Praise the Lord. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Sorry, my sound system just buzzed in my ear. I'm thankful that God's the same no matter where we go. Amen. We can worship Him at home. We can worship Him at, in our car. We can worship Him here. And I'm thankful that when we come together here, we're a group of people in one accord, in one mindset to honor the Almighty God, the only one who saved us and bought us and loved us. Amen. So why don't we go to the Lord in prayer this morning? Let's welcome him into this service and ask that he have his way. Father, we thank you for all that you do, for all that you are. God, there's no one else like you and none beside you, Jesus. I pray, Father, that you would move in this church today, God. I already feel your spirit moving in our hearts now, God. I pray, Father, that you would have your way in our hearts and our minds, God. Let every single one of us leave changed and made new in your matchless mighty name, Jesus. We give you all the glory and all the honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Worship with us as we sing. Because of who you are, I give you glory. And because of who you are, I give you praise. Because of who you are, I will lift my voice and Lord, I worship you because of who you are, because, because of who you are, I give you glory, and because of who you are, I give you praise, and because of who you are. I will lift my voice and say, Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Jehovah Jireh, you're my provider. Jehovah Nisi, Lord, you reign in victory. Jehovah Who you are, and I would. 
worship you because of who you are. Why don't we do that right now? God, there's no one else like you. Father, you're worthy of the glory and the honor and the adoration, Jesus. You're so mighty and so holy, God. God we worship you in this house today, God. I'm thankful that I can worship him here, but how many of us are ready for when we get to worship him in heaven? It says everybody's going to be happy up there. Amen? Worship with us as we sing. Everybody will be happy, will be happy over there. We will shout and sing God's praises. Everybody will be happy over there. who saved us and kept us by his grace. What a mighty God we serve. Amen. We're going to dismiss into our Sunday school classes at this time. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be both be out here. Everybody else is going to go in the back. Amen. Go in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord, church. Amen. It's good to be in God's house. We are extremely excited about what
God is doing in our church, the way he's moving, touching, ministering. Of lately, we have seen just the very tremendous hand of God moving among us, and we are thankful for that. Amen. We're going to get right on into our study because I would like to finish this up today. Amen. And um, we have been on this for a couple of Sundays, and we have been talking about the power of proximity. In other words, the influence that being next to something, close to something, has upon our life. And uh, we have been looking at Nehemiah chapter 3. We won't read those scriptures because we have done uh, that before. And so we're going to make reference back to that. So if you want to turn to Nehemiah chapter 3, we're just looking basically at verses 1 through 4. And um, so uh, again, we're not going to go back. If you would like to go on our... um, live stream as far as Facebook or YouTube, uh, you can go back and look at those and kind of rehearse, refresh your memory. Uh, If you've been out sick uh, and was not able to watch us live stream at that time, then you can go back and get kind of caught up to where we are today. Amen. But we have been looking at the power of proximity. And we've looked at the example or the tremendous truth of what Nehemiah was able to accomplish in just 52 short days to where his predecessor, Zerubbabel, worked over 90 years and did not accomplish what Nehemiah did. And I believe that it is not just coincidence, but I believe that Nehemiah, uh, of course, got divine direction from God, and he leveraged the power of proximity. Case in point, have you ever worked on a job where the person next to you was a slacker? I mean, I've, I've worked with individuals that all they done was hold up a shovel. And when they heard my dad coming down the highway, they would, and some of them would even go as far as want to rub dirt on them or, you know, act like they were sweating or something or whatever. But uh, if you've got somebody working next to you that's a slacker, it does have an effect upon you because you're saying, why am I doing all the work? I think I'll slack off too. But if you got somebody there that's working just as hard as you are, then there is that that motivation, that encouragement to kind of match their work and work just as hard as they are. And that's what I mean by the area of the power of proximity. So, Again, Nehemiah built these walls in 52 days. Zerubbabel worked 90 years on them and never accomplished it. So when we begin to look, and we're going to start at PowerPoint 10, Amber, uh, we talked about the area of, of um, the area of building and the area of rebuilding. So in other words, when we look at these portions of Scripture, there were things that Nehemiah built. It says that he built. And then there were things that Nehemiah rebuilt. When you rebuild something, something was already there. When you remodel a house, the house was already there. You just went in there and maybe took some things out that needed to be taken out, and you you rebuilt it. You You put other stuff in there. When you build a house, you start from scratch. You just level a piece of ground and go out there and start building. So in our walk with God, there are those two areas where God has built something in our life. Aren't you glad that old things are passed away and all things can become new? We are new creatures in Christ. In other words, He has built something. And then as we walk with Him, there is this process of rebuilding. 
In other words, there are things in our life, whether we may not be aware of it until a preacher preaches or we read something in the Word of God or in our daily prayer life, God speaks to us and we realize that maybe God needs to rebuild a, a passion in our life or rebuild the faith in our life. It was there at one time. It was just over circumstance, over time, over situations. And even by our own neglect, things just begin to fall apart. But thank God for people that have a desire to rebuild things in their walk with God. And we looked at a verse of scripture where in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18, the Apostle Paul says, Now all things are of God who has reconciled us unto himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. And we talked a little bit about how that each and every one of us in here is called to the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, we are called to help people get back into a right relationship with God. When you, when you reconcile somebody, you know, there's this area of mediation. There's this area of talking. You reconcile an individual back to another individual. And so it is we have that honor of being able to go out in that world or even in the church to a brother or sister and begin to help that ministry of reconciliation. Now, I want to start new ground here in uh, our transparent, uh, our PowerPoint 11. And I talked about that there are three people that we want to stay close to in rebuilding our life. And here again, all of us are building something. We're either building something or we're rebuilding something. Nobody in this church should be in an inactive mode in your walk with God. We need to be constantly, as Paul said, constantly pressing forward. We need to be constantly developing and growing our relationship with God. And so we see in this area here that I do not believe that these men were again side by side. We looked at the word next, and the word next means to be close to, to be beside something. But it also, in the Hebrew term, had a sense of not only being beside, but being over with the ability of having a hand extended down. In other words, I took the little example of when Peter began to walk to Jesus, and he got his eyes off of the Lord, he began to sink. He was next to Jesus, so all Jesus had to do was to step forward, reach out, grab his hand, and pull him up. Thank God for people in the church that have that ability that when we are low in God, and let me say, you're not always going to be riding cloud nine. David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, there's going to be hilltop experiences and there's also going to be valleys. But I'm glad that when we walk through those low places to where we may be weak in our faith in God, that there is somebody close enough to us, a brother or sister, that can reach a hand down and say, let me encourage you. Amen. So let's look at uh, Elishabah. Elishab was the first name that Nehemiah, when he began to talk about that this person was next to this person, that person was next to that person, that person was next to the other person. Matter of fact, in those four verses, four or five verses, the word next is used 16 times. So it's important of who you're next to. Now notice this, and I want you to keep this in mind, 90 years no walls built, no gates hung, nothing rebuilt, scattered here and there. 52 days, walls built, gates hung, security for the people living inside of the city. Notice this, Elishabub. The first builder we meet is Elishabub. 
he was a high priest, and he and his company of priests rebuilt a portion of the wall that included the sheep gate. What's interesting is the meaning of this builder's name. Elisha means God will restore. Say it with me. God will restore. It's not that God might restore or um, God can restore, but his name meant that God will restore. Now, can you imagine seeing all of the rubble? And you have to understand, not only were they facing a burnt city, a destroyed temple, and walls that were broken down for over 150 years, not only were they facing that, but they had Sanbana, Tobai. They had other individuals that were coming against them, outsiders, amen, that were not wanting them to rebuild the wall, not wanting them to reclaim their identity their, uh, as, as children of God. And they did everything they could. They mocked them. They sent letters to other kings and things of that nature, trying to hinder their work. So not only did they have that, but they had the rubble that was it. Can you imagine working there and all of a sudden getting within your mind, this is too big for us. We're tired. We're weak. Where's God in the middle of this? We're trying to restore these walls. We're trying to rebuild our temple. We're trying to get back to, to worship and things of that nature. And, and we've got Sanballat over here. He's, he's threatening us, you know, and things of that nature. And, and so I imagine that there were some times that people begin to get discouraged. But can you imagine working beside Elisha to where when you begin to get discouraged and you think that the job's too big and somehow you come to a point in your relationship with God that it's gone too far, that God can't restore it. God can't restore these walls. God can't restore our marriage. God can't restore my finances. God can't restore my health. Thank God that we can work right along beside and here again, it's your responsibility to position yourself in a place where you can have success in your walk with God. And what greater individual, what greater attitude or spirit that you can position yourself beside than Elisha that says God will restore. So Elisha said, come on guys. We can do this. God's with us. We're going to rebuild these walls. We're going to rebuild our temple. And they would look and they would say, you know, as they're building, they would look at this priest working beside them and they would say, Elisha, God will restore. And you imagine how that helped them, how that encouraged them. And so I do believe that working along beside Elisha had a positive impact upon those that were actually working around him. Matter of fact, in Joel chapter 2 verse 25, and this is a promise to us, is that the Lord promised to restore the years of the locust, years that the locust has eaten and the pommel worm and the canker worm had destroyed. Matter of fact, in Revelation 21 verse 5, it says of Jesus saying this, I will make all things new. I will make all things new. So when we're working, when we're rebuilding things in our life, make sure you put yourself in a position, in a place where you're working along beside someone or whatever it may be that you are working, that your spirit is coming in contact with somebody that says God will restore. You need to rebuke the lie of Satan in your life. 
Because there's a lot of negative people that will come into you and say, you might as well just go ahead and divorce him or divorce her because God, God can't do anything with him or God can't do anything with her or whatever it may be. But I'm telling you, when those times come, you need to find an Elisha bub in the church, somebody that had come up to you and say, God can restore it. He done it for me. He saved my husband, put our marriage back together. He saved my wife, put my marriage back together. Or God will restore my health. Come on, has anybody ever been healed by the power of God? Do you know that you are a you are a lifeshabub? When someone's sick, you can go up to them and you can have that spirit on you that says God can restore, God will restore. You are a lifeshabub. You're working next to them, and so we see that we need to stick close to people of faith in a vision. Slide thirteen. And there will be times when you will need to reach out to them and they can extend a, a open hand of confidence. So stay in close proximity to hope. And that will help you overcome doubt, discouragement in your life, and it will enable you to keep right on building. Now next to Elisha was Zachar. And let's look at what he adds to those that are around him. You already got one that you're working by that says God will restore. Now notice, it was Nehemiah that placed these men and their workers in certain places on this wall. Zachar, and next to Elishab and his crew, there were the men of Jericho, and next to them was Zachar. The name Zachar means to mention often or to remember or to reflect. Now, what is the positive effect on having somebody next to you that often remembers or that mentions often or that reflects often? Well, it has a tremendous effect when you begin to think about what God has done in your life, one of the beautiful things that you can give to your children and grandchildren is your testimony of what God's done in your life. Because if the Lord tarries, they're going to be young adults. Or they may be, you know, middle-aged adults or whatever it may be. Or even in their own young walk with God. They're going to need God to come on the scene and do something for them. And if, and if we have put into their spirit, I know they say, well, yeah, here's Grandpa. He's going to tell that story one more time about how God healed him. Yeah, Grandma, she's going to tell that story of how that she didn't have nothing to feed her family and all of a sudden she prayed and there was a knock on the door. She went to it and couldn't see nobody, but yet there was a sack of groceries there right outside the door. Yeah, here comes that, here comes that story again. It's the 90th time we've heard it. But you know what? Let them get to a place where they need God to provide something and it looks like it's not going to happen. And I hope there's a Zerubbabel that will come to them. <laughs> Excuse me, a Zachar that will come to them and say, hey, let me tell you what God's done for me. Not only that, but it is encouraging in your own self. Have you ever talked to yourself? David said, I encourage myself in the Lord. You know, it's once said that it's okay to talk to yourself. And it's even okay to answer yourself. But what you don't want to do is go, huh? So in your walk with God, there's going to be times you're going to have to quote scripture. Come on, I need something. I need God to move on the scene. I don't need it next week. I don't need it tomorrow. I need it now. I need something from God now. Well, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. The Lord is a strong tower. He is the help in the time of trouble. You see what I'm saying? You see how that can encourage you? 
But what the devil wants to do is put people in your life that's going to speak negative things to you. Or you remember how this one let you down or or how, how this one disappointed you or how God didn't do this for you, how God didn't do that. But you need to remember there is life in hope. They say when it concerns cancer patients, those who have a, uh, a bright outlook, a hope on life, have a lot better chance of cancer going into remission than somebody just simply gives up and eats worms and says, well, you know, I'm just going to die. That's it. Remember that God has forgiven you of your sin. And here again, I'm not advocating you to go out and sin. But I do know I live in flesh just like you do. And there are times that we're going to fail God. Yeah, we are. And there are times not only we're going to make mistakes, but we're going to actually sin. We know it's wrong, but we do it anyway. And the devil will come to you and say, that's it. God's forgotten you. He's cast you off to the side. But if you can remember, one of the greatest things that go through my mind when the enemy comes and says, well, you failed God again, so that's it. God's cutting you off. I go back to the time that when I first got in church, the last time, the last time I got in church, I came down to the altar and Brother Wheeler, you, you, here we go, pastor's going to give that message again. Brother Wheeler preached a message. If God did it once, he can do it again. I came down to the altar and I said, God, if you ever fill me with the Holy Ghost, you can fill me again. Because the devil had me convinced that I was reprobate. The devil had me convinced that God was not going to forgive me of my sin. And I'd, I'd come to that point was believing that. But I came, a man of God preached that message. I came to the altar, I said, God, if you ever filled me with the Holy Ghost once, you can do it again. If you ever forgave me of my sin once, you can do it again. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. Your, your mercies and, and your everlasting love is from everlasting to everlasting. I didn't even get that out of my mouth until I was speaking in tongues, raising my hand, fell flat on my back. I didn't have Benny Hinn guys to catch me neither. Come on, I hit that ground with a thud. Didn't even know I hit the ground. All I knew was I was talking in tongues. When I finally came to myself, I, I was there on the floor. I thought I was standing up. I was there on the floor, and all of a sudden I realized, my God, I'm on the floor. What I'm trying to say is you need to remember often what God has already done for you. The Lord told the children of Israel when they crossed over the Jordan River and other different places in the Bible, they set up what was called memorials. They took stones out of the River Jordan and placed them on the other side and built this big monument of stones. And so they're asking, well, why are we doing this? And well, the Lord instructed Joshua so that when your children come by and say, what does these stones mean? You can tell them, this is how God brought us out of slavery. He brought us across the Red Sea. And when the Jordan banks were swelling the river was swelling. Amen. God parted the waters here. We walked across on dry ground and these stones are what come out of the middle of the river Jordan. Remember what don't lose sight of any miracle God has already performed in your life. That will encourage you. You need to look to the past and it will motivate your future. Let's look at another one here. Number three. So we've got Elishab, Zichar, and here's Hassanai. Again, he's next to God will restore the miracles of God of past remembered. And now we've got Hassanai. We see that Hassanai's main name meant direct or to the point. These were, if these sons actually lived up to their name, and I believe they did, they were of a no-nonsense crew who did not waste time on small talk. These individuals were focused, they were deliberate, and they did not get distracted. Listen to me. 
We live in a day in a society where the number one weapon the enemy is going to use on you is distraction. You know what, a, you know what makes a good, a good uh, I don't want to say musician, the guy that does, I can't pronounce his name now. Anyway, he does tricks. Let's put it that way. I get a word stuck in my mind and I can't get away from it. I'm sorry. But what he does is what makes him good at what he does, he's good at distraction. He gets up here and flounces his hand around and while you're looking at his hand, he's doing something over here and before you know it, you're like, wow, how did you do that? Well, he distracted you. And so in this area here, we see that, that Hass and I were a group of men that were not slackers. They didn't get, they didn't get distracted by maybe negative stuff or who was talking about what. They were focused on their section of the wall. Listen to me. If you're going to do anything for God, you cannot be one that's easily distracted. The enemy will put people in your life to try to get you distracted from the purpose and the will of God in your life. Matter of fact, you that are single, be aware of this. Because the devil will try to, you say, well, that guy's from God. Well, how do you know that? You know, the enemy can also move people in and out of your life also too. And if he can get you distracted by a relationship that should not be there, if he can get you distracted and get you pulled away from God, get you looking more at that person, that individual, spending your time there instead of developing your relationship with God. I'm not saying that you can't have a relationship with, with uh, another individual. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying not everything comes from God. The devil... You can become distracted. Find people who are focused on the same goals you are and rebuild your life alongside of them. I hope that you're getting this because, again, 90 years, 52 days. And it was because they had somebody that they were working beside that said, God will restore. Remember the great things of God, miracles of God. Don't get distracted. And then we come to another one. And I'm not going to go into a lot of these names here because I don't have time. My time is winding down. But Marathoth, next to, um, ne next to him was Marathoth, which name means, notice this, his name means flame of God. <laughs> like that. Being on fire. The Bible says iron sharpeth iron. And if you want to be on fire for God, who do you need to be around? A bunch of wet blankets? A bunch of people that don't believe in signs, miracles, and wonders? No. You need to be next to someone. You need to be rebuilding, linking arms with somebody that's on fire for God. And it's amazing when you begin to talk to somebody that has like passions like you have, it's amazing how you'll just lose yourself in time. Case in point, Friday night, Brother King, which is doing a lot better. He appreciates your prayers and all that you have done for him on his behalf. But we had said we we're going to get up, and so we stopped over there at a Mexican restaurant in Chipley. That's about halfway we got there at 6 o'clock. We ordered and started eating. Next thing you know, Sister Big and Sister King is talking about stuff, talking about the Word and different stuff. And me and Brother King, we're talking about Word, different messages. And, you know, we're sitting there, and sometimes we kind of get loud because we're just excited. You know, preachers sometimes have that ability of getting loud, you know. 
And so uh, everybody in that area there were getting a little bit of a um, highlight of what our messages were that Bible studies we've been teaching and preaching. And next thing we know, all of a sudden, lights started going off in the restaurant. And we're looking like, what's going on here? And then we looked around and realized, there's nobody in the restaurant. And the guy comes by and says, we're closing up. Okay, I guess we've got to go. We shut the place down at 930. Didn't even realize we'd been there that long. We were just so excited talking about the word of God. And the thing about it was we went outside the restaurant. Started talking about the word of God some more. We were standing out there. You know what they did? They cut the cod picking porch light out on us. They said, we need you to get your vehicle. They didn't say it, but, it, you know, click, lights off, no light out there, you know. Click, get in your car and go home. But here again, we got so caught up in the joy of sharing and talking that we really didn't realize here again. Watch who you're next to. And then we've got next to Meriboth, we've got Ashilabob. Or, and it names mean the blessings of God. So can you imagine, here again, working on a wall, God will restore, remembering the miracles of God, remembering what God has done for us. And then again, you've got, to, here again, you've got this area here of, of the flame of God, and then you've got the blessing of God. I, I didn't even get into the rest of them, but I guarantee you, not one of their names is going to have a negative connotation about it. Like God is defeated. Or God's not faithful. 52 days of what one person 90 years could not do simply because they leveraged the power of proximity. It took them... It took all of them working side by side, each offering a particular strength and lending a hand to the others that were needed. Here again, there are going to be times we're going to go through the low places. But make sure that you're within reach of somebody that can influence you in a powerful way. It was one person next to another person next to another person next to another person. And here is the really important thing. You're next in line. So you have the honor and privilege of not only working next to someone that is positive, but you have the ability to work on your wall in a positive way that will influence someone else. The Apostle Paul wrote it this way, and I'm coming to a close. I got five minutes. Ephesians 4.16 says, For whom the whole body fitted jointly together and compact by which every joint is supplied according to the effectual working of the measure of every part making increase of the body unto the edification of itself in love. In other words, this was a description that Paul was saying, every member has a part. Every member is fitted jointly together with another member. And when we do that, what happens? We make increase. We build stuff for the glory of God. We can restore stuff with God's help in people's life simply because we are connected with people that have that positive influence upon our life. My next slide, and I come here just asking a few simple questions. Rick, if you'll come and help me. 
Amen. I, I just didn't want to give this Bible study and then just kind of leave it in your lap. But what I've got here is just a, a one-sheet thing. And if you would like one, just raise your hand. I'd like for all of you to get one if you would, each person. And what I want you to do is in your prayer time that you have, your devotional time, I'd like for you just to kind of feel this out. And in doing so, it'll be one or two things that will happen. And what I'm hoping in this area is, is that when you begin to feel this thing out, when you begin to feel this, this applying the principles, this self-inventory questionnaire out, and like number one it says, do I need more confidence, motivation, or focus? Name one person in this church that you could actually link up with that will help you in that weakness. Not only that, but maybe you can look around and find someone else that you can help, that you can lift up. And as you're reading that, I want to finish these last few comments here. Are you leveraging the power of proximity by sticking close to hopeful, faithful people who can lend a hand and bolster your strength? Or are you multiplying your distractions and weaknesses, your resolve to, to standing alongside um, negative people or in questionable situations? Nehemiah understood that great opportunities come our way when we are in the right place at the right time. So let me just say this. Choose your companions wisely. And instead of someone having a negative effect on you, why don't you have and put it within your heart a desire to have a positive effect on them? Come on. Not only that, Seek out wise and successful mentors. I believe that this is one of the things that sometimes we kind of overlook when we're talking about building a relationship with God because we think that we've got to do it all by ourselves. But do you realize that there are people in this church that have valuable skills and wonderful spirits that can actually help you build your relationship with God? Not only that, you need to leverage the power of proximity and put yourself in a position to succeed and to enhance, notice, the faith of others. You see, it's not just about making sure that we have a positive spirit. It's not just about making sure that our spirit is encouraged and our faith is strengthened and our faith is enlarged and things of that nature. But notice the word next to is to reach down with a hand to help someone else up. That's what it's all about, folks. It's not just about me, myself, and I when it comes to a walk with God. We are the body of Christ. Can the eye say to the toe because you don't see or you're not really important? that we can do without you? Well, cut your big toe off and see how much balance you have. See how you're able not to run or to walk because that big toe, as ugly as it may look like, actually help you keep your balance. Come on. Can the ear say to the tear duck because you don't hear you're not able to hear beautiful music. Can we say to the tear duck, we just don't need you? No, because you know what the tear duck does? It keeps your eyes moist. And in keeping your eyes moist, it allows you to see. So what I'm trying to say here, it doesn't matter how small you think you are in the kingdom of God or how big you think you might be in the kingdom of God. We need everybody. And so find ways not only you can help yourself, but you can mentor someone next to you 
and lift them up and bring them up to a higher plane in their walk with God. Again, I'd like for you to do this questionnaire here. In other words, state the primary difficulty you're trying to overcome. And then name one person in this church or someone in, some, in, in, in another church who has successfully faced that challenge and has overcome it. And then make an appointment to meet with them and talk to them. How did you overcome this? How, how, did, how did God navigate you through this situation that you're going through? Because listen to me, whether we realize it or not, we all face common situations. We really do. How many has ever been sick in here? How many has ever got a bad report from a doctor? How many has had financial problems? <laughs> Come on. And we could go right on down the list. How many is in here is, is struggling with a prodigal child? Some child that you brought to church, raised in church, and all of a sudden now they're out in the world doing, and you're struggling with that. Find somebody in this church that has had the same situation, but God has saved their child, brought him into church, and say, I need some encouragement. <laughs> Come on, Elisha. Tell me how God's going to restore something. Tell me how God's going to restore my kid. Come on. He did it for you. <laughs> now, come on, feed my faith here. It's a wonderful thing to have a brother or sister in the Lord that can do that for you. But you've got to seek them out. You've got to go to them. Not only that, but list some places where you spend most of your time during the week. List things you encounter uh, that are that are uh, help you uh, that are uh, encounter there that help you overcome adversity or create stress, tension, or temptation. If they help you, continue in them. If they're creating stress, temptation in your life, maybe you want to pull back away from that. And identify persons who might be a mentor to you. Spend some time talking with that person. I'm going to close with this. And I remember as a young minister, um, I went and talked to one of the elders that brought this Pentecostal message to the, one of the first preachers that brought this Pentecostal message to Texas when I was in Bible college. I sought him out. His name was Brother Lambert. I went to his home, found out where he lived, went to his home, knocked on the door. He answered the door, and I asked him if I could talk with him for just a few minutes. We sat down there, and I asked him questions like, when you were preaching, when you were evangelizing, when you were pastoring, what was one of the main things that was stressed in, in, in that era of time that we see that we're not stressing now without batting an eye. You know what he said? Repentance. He said, nowadays, pastors are so gung-ho about getting them filled with the Holy Ghost, he said, they don't let people repent. He said, people need to repent. They need to tell God they're sorry. Have a change of mind, change of heart. And I can remember getting up from that interview, if you want to put it that way, getting up, and walking out, and I walked out that door and started walking to my car, and the Lord tapped me on my shoulder, and he said, what are you doing? You have just talked with one of our great Pentecostal pioneers that brought this apostolic message to Texas, and you're just walking out the door? And all of a sudden, I remember of a story of a prophet by the name of Elisha that went to Elijah and asked if he could have a double portion. I went back to his door, knocked on it again. He opened the door and said, yes, can I help you? I said, sir, can I step into your home one more time? He said, yeah, come on in. I stepped in. I says, listen, I'd like for you to lay your hands on me, and I'm gonna, I want you to pray that God will give me a double portion of what your ministry was. Now, when that man laid his hands on me, 
It was unreal. <laughs> right there in his living room, he began to pray for me. I'm telling you, I told you that story because it made such a powerful impact upon my life and upon my ministry that I still remember it even to this day, almost 30-something years later. Find you somebody you can link up to and let them help you in your walk with God. Would you stand with me this morning? Precious Savior, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the people of God that have gathered here today, that have opened up their minds and their hearts and their spirit to the working of your spirit. We ask you now, Lord, that you would help us not only to seek out individuals that will help us in our walk with God, to put ourselves in position next to those that will help us in our walk with God, encourage us, strengthen our faith. But Lord, help us also seek out and reach down with a helpful hand to those who might be struggling next to us. Because, Lord, we want to build something great for your kingdom. And we know, Lord, that together and with you, all things are possible. We thank you for your touch. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Well, this ends our study here. I hope it's helped you. Amen. Give us a few moments to change order of our service. God bless you. Yes. Yeah, hold on.